Welcome back to Over the Air, IoT Connected Devices and the Journey. My name is Ryan Prosser, CEO of Very, and today we're joined by Stuart Lombard, founder and CEO at Ecobee. We're going to be talking about, last episode we talked about what to do if you're a mouse and the elephants are fighting. Today we're going to talk about what to do if you're one of the elephants fighting with another elephant. Ecobee taking on some big competitors in this space. Stuart, thanks for being on the show. Thanks very much for having me. Great. So, you know, I think Ecobee is a household name, but for folks that don't know, give us 30 seconds on Ecobee. Sure. So our mission is to help people live simpler and better lives, but to do it in a more sustainable way. And so we make connected home devices like thermostats, which we're best known for, but also uh, home security products uh, to help you live, uh, you know, a home in a home that's comfortable, uh, that gives you peace of mind, that's resilient to weather, uh, and that is energy efficient. So we're going to be talking a little bit about one of your products, which I've got here with me today. Reminder to the audience, we do not allow anybody to sponsor. We don't accept any money. We only review products that we genuinely really like a lot. But one of the things, you know, right off the bat, I always love to ask questions I myself am genuinely interested in. We talked about picking a fight with an elephant. I think in this case, you guys actually predate Google Home. So who's picking a fight with who is debatable, but what's it like to be going head to head with one of the biggest names in technology? It can be definitely uncomfortable at times. I think, you know, one of the things for us was that it was a company changing event for us. You know, when we were, before Google entered the market, before Nest entered it in the, into the market, you know, we were the only smart thermostat manufacturer. You know, we were high-fiving each other. People told us how smart we were and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, then, then Google entered the market or Nest entered the market and it was like, oh shit, like, you know, these guys are good, right? And, you know, we thought we were playing in Major League Baseball, but we were playing, you know, Pee Wee Baseball somewhere. We just didn't realize it, right? And that realization of, you know, the difference between wanting to be good and being good is, you know, was an incredible uh, realization to me and a wake-up call. And that really forced us to sort of retool and think about what it takes to really be successful. And I think, you know, other people have talked about a worthy competitor uh, in our case, Nest has definitely been a worthy competitor. They've really pushed us uh, to be a better business, um, to push the envelope, uh, and to really figure out, you know, how good could we be? Um, and so they've been super important, not that I want to give them credit, but in, you know, helping us really push the envelope of what is possible, really focus on how we help our customers. Um, and so even though at the time it was incredibly uncomfortable and it felt horrible, it actually turned out to be one of the best things for us. It's interesting, as we sit here today in uh, mid-November 2022, uh, Ticketmaster is once again in the news as, you know, their monopoly. They are providing a terrible service. People are extremely angry. There was a big incident yesterday where they had an outage. And it seems to underscore, once again, that monopolies are, I guess, great for investors and terrible for absolutely everybody else. Maybe not even great for investors over the long term. I hear you saying, hey, listen, they've this competition with Google has made us better than we might have otherwise been. P play out a scenario for me. You know, you, you walk into a bar, there's somebody way at the end of the bar that is just sobbing into their whiskey and you say, my God, what's everything okay? What's going on? And they say, Google has just entered our market. We're dead. We'll never be able to see the other side of this. What are three things you might share with that person about not necessarily silver linings, but some truths that they haven't considered or tactics to compete against effectively uh, against a really giant tech company like Google? Yeah, I think a few things. You know, the first is um, don't underestimate the power of word of mouth. Right. And so creating great customer experiences, creating tremendous loyalty in your customer base creating incredible fans that has tremendous power and anyone can do that. You know, if you can build some really great products that, that meet your customers needs. I think the second thing is don't try and play their game, right? Should never try and out Google, Google, they're going to, you know, they will drive you into the ground. And so it's really about thinking about your strengths versus your weaknesses. And frankly, their greatest strengths are the greatest weaknesses. They're, you know, and you can use that against them. So, for example, in our case, you know, we partnered with Apple and we know that the Apple ecosystem is important to people. And so by partnering with Apple, we could win in the Apple ecosystem, which would be very hard for Google to do. You know, you can be more gorilla. You know, they have to be corporate. You can be gorilla. They're not good at things like installation, for example, and things that are difficult to install. Well, we really leaned into the heating and cooling service channel. And that was a big win for us. And then they're going to go broad because they're looking for really big markets. You know, they need... 
a $10 billion market in order for it to be interesting to them. You know, there's lots of areas where you can go deep, like we've done in energy, for example, uh, you know, where they're not as interested in playing. And I think by going deep and creating a fan base, um, you can really have, you know, tremendous, tremendous impact. One of the things that I'm curious about, Ecobee's, I would characterize you guys kind of one of the OGs of smart home. You know, you've been around for 15 years. What are some of the things, you know, folks out there listening today and they're they're taking notes about how to compete effectively in this space. You guys, you know, came up in a little bit of a different era. Um, to say you guys were pre-matter is to understate it wildly. I mean, you were pre-everything. <laughs> What, what are some things that didn't exist at that time or maybe did exist that don't exist now that you, you, you look at and say, man, if we had had that, that would have been nice. Or the flip, listen, I'm glad we didn't have to deal with that at that time. We're looking for like differences between 2022 and 2007 as you kind of look at the two spaces. And we're kind of talking right now to entrepreneurs that are coming up and they're trying to draw parallels between the Ecobee story and their story. What are some of the differences? I think, you know, the the biggest differences are that really none of the infrastructure existed to create IoT companies. IoT wasn't even a thing. This podcast didn't exist. Or I assume <laughs> it didn't. You know, no one was talking about it. So I think, you know, from a market awareness point of view, you know, we were talking about thermostats and people were like, what, are you guys crazy? Uh, so I'd say that's one thing. From a tools perspective, like, Raspberry Pi didn't even exist. So if you thought about what it took to actually get a prototype up and running and those types of things, very, very difficult. And then none of the chip manufacturers wanted to talk to you, but you, you needed them on board because you needed to be able to, you know, create the prototypes and, and, and those types of things. And so I think that was incredibly challenging. And today, you know, you're seeing really nice dev kits. A lot of the messiness has been worked out. We started working with you know, Amazon on integrating thermostats into Alexa, for example, you know, none of those skills or any of those, you know, integration uh, APIs existed. We were writing them in real time uh, and same with Apple and HomeKit. And so I think from that perspective, the market is much, much more defined. On the negative side, I think, you know, the supply chain challenges we've witnessed over the last two years, you know, would have killed us, I think, if we were a smaller company, because, you know, you're seeing, you know, large chip manufacturers saying we're not going to ship you chips and we're not going to ship you chips for a year and a half. Right. Which effectively means you're out of business. And, you know, if you don't have enough weight and leverage, you know, you tend to be on the short end of that stick. And so I think that's one of the things that's become more challenging now than it was maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. The supply chain issue in particular just seems like such a accidental i think it probably has killed off a portion of a generation of hardware companies that that just were not anticipating they wouldn't be able to get chips they wouldn't be able to to get products through the port of los angeles port of long beach coming from china which is where almost all products are coming from what is it you know you talked about i, I really liked what you said about um differentiation don't try to beat Google at Google's game. I, I think tech generally is learning this lesson on the employer side. You know, they're saying, listen, Google is always going to be the like crank the workplace benefits up to 11 guys, and they're going to win that war. And you try to out Google Google, you know, you better be printing money like they are. But what are the, you know, there's other ways that as an employer, you can differentiate and provide a, a different experience. Bring it back to the product side or the product development side. What are Go a little deeper on that. What are some of the things at Ecobee that you guys think you guys have cranked to 11 in order to really differentiate yourself as a, you know, it, it, the, the final product that you've made? And, you know, if you want to bring, so I'm, I'm holding up uh, for those that are just listening and cannot see the, the live stream. I've got their smart thermostat here, which we're fans of. But like, talk about how is this product different than Google's uh, Nest thermostat product, for example? So uh, I'll take that in two parts. I think from an employee perspective, don't underestimate two things. One, you know, being part of a mission driven company and, and having employees who are really bought into the mission. And I think, you know, when you're a startup, people love the love the mission. The second thing I would say is their work has meaning and impact. Right. And if you're one of 70,000 engineers at Google, you might work on a tiny little piece of something that does something. Uh, but the question is, does your does your work really have impact, right? And and the great thing about when you're working at a startup, one is your experience is much more varied because you tend to participate in in more activities across a broader range. 
And then you have direct drive from like the code you write or, you know, the hardware you design to the impact it has on the customer. And it moves the needle every single day and it matters. And, and that I think is, is a huge advantage for startups and more than perks and more than compensation and more than everything else. Um, you know, I think those things matter for a lot of people. In terms of the product, what's really exciting about, about the new smart thermostat premium is if you look at it, it's totally redesigned. It's a gorgeous design. It has a metal frame. The glass front is completely unblemished. It's got a waterfall edge. We've totally redesigned the user experience. So it's much, much easier to use. Open it up on the inside. It's got a quad core 1.5 gigahertz CPU with, you know, 500 megs of uh, RAM and two gigs of flash. And so, you know, we can download software to it. It evolves over time. It'll do new things. It's got some great technologies like radar in it for doing, you know, person detection and understanding whether someone's in your home or not, um, you know, which is way better than the previous technology, which was PIR technology. It's got some phenomenal uh, energy savings algorithms in there. Um, it's packed with sensors. And so it's got microphones. So it's like a Siri voice assistant. It's also an Alexa voice assistant, but it can listen for your smoke detector. You know, it can be a glass break sensor. Um, it's got an indoor air quality monitor in it. Um, and it's a hub for Ecobee's new smart security system. And so, you know, the device just does a ton. It looks beautiful and it should save you about 26% on your heating and cooling costs. And so, you know, it'll also pay for itself. I want to get into the, um, the ability to source clean energy in a moment, but I want to call out, we have a, a member of our audience that's listening live. He says, Todd uh, Herzl says, I uh, recently installed an Ecobee and it's like 1000 X better than Nest. So that's hot off the presses for those awesome. at home. Love um, you. <laughs> yeah. So thanks Todd for the, for the contribution. So I mentioned we were going to talk about this. I, I think for a lot of people, the ability to not just have their home operate more efficiently, but uh, p participate or contribute in some small way to how the country or the world is sourcing energy. You guys have, I, I think, a creative approach. Um, can you talk about that? The ability to like uh, tap into some of these clean energy sources at the home level? Yeah, I think we're doing, you know, a few really cool things. The first thing we're doing is we have software we call EcoPlus and it uses AI and machine learning to take advantage of, of times when energy is clean and cheap. So you'll use a little bit more energy when energy is clean and cheap and less energy when it's expensive and dirty, frankly. And so you get the dual benefit of, of you know, energy that's both cleaner and cheaper. And, and, and that's a tremendous opportunity. On the other side, we have a program called Donate Your Data to Science, and we enable our customers to click a link and, and, and essentially allows us to anonymize their data and share it with researchers, doing all kinds of interesting things, everything from how does COVID spread in homes to um, what happens when we have a heat bubble on the West Coast and, and, and does that create negative health incomes or outcomes? Uh, and then you've got things like, you know, do we need to build a power plant in Indiana? And so... Researchers doing really, really cool things. And so not only are we just focused on how do we create great experiences for our customers, but long term, how do we create more sustainable communities? And, uh, you know, again, working with, you know, researchers at Lawrence Livermore and all kinds of phenomenal research institutions doing wonderful things with the data. The next question is my one of my favorites. I love to ask CEOs this question. I love to ask CEO founder CEOs this question that have taken things from idea embryonic concept to, you know, all the way to today. They've made it multiple uh, iterations through. I call it the wrong side of impossible. This idea that any great technology company has had to solve a previously unsolved problem, or maybe it was previously solved, but at a different price point, you know, so they're at a radically different price point than what the, you know, sort of the, the Henry Ford type deal. Didn't invent cars, but really brought it to the mainstream. Talk to me about wrong side of impossible for Ecobee. What, what was this moment that sort of looks and feels like the guys, we've got to solve this thing. This is existential. This is critical for us. What did that look like for you guys and how'd you approach it? Yeah, I think we've had a few over the years, so we could, we could talk about a few. You know, the first one was just the zero to one problem. So people ask me like, you know, did you have a background in consumer electronics? You know, did you grow up in the heating and cooling space? Um, you know, none of the founders, do anything about consumer electronics or, or about, you know, the heating and cooling space. And so, 
you know, the first problem I think was just the zero to one uh, problem where we, you know, we saw an opportunity uh, and we were trying to get traction and thermostats at the time people were like, you know, nobody cares about thermostats and you're crazy. And so figuring out, you know, how to get up to speed, how to create a product from nothing um, and having the, you know, the tenacity to, to, to do that. And then, and then to create real value for customers, you know, by using data, by using information like electricity rates and weather, um, you know, how do you, how do you create a, a great product? And then literally going out on the road, selling it, you know, driving with heating and cooling service technicians every single day. Um, you know, that was a huge zero to one problem that, uh, that we faced that, you know, definitely felt like it was the wrong side of impossible. I have a question I wasn't planning to ask, but you, you kind of dove into it. CEOs and founding executives, founding team members um, that do not have, I guess, resident experience, you know, the correct uh, industry experience. We see this over and over, not just on the show, but, you know, you see this in the news uh, that, uh, like, I don't, I don't know that Elon Musk was an automotive guy, you know, maybe he yeah. liked cars, but I mean, he, he certainly is not like a, a Ford executive prior to that, which I think frankly helped him. But we see over and over that this is no impediment to success and often is the reason for the success. You're not, you don't got, you don't have these boat anchor uh, type ideas of yesteryear. Talk a little bit about that. You're entering this space. This thermostats are not a new space, but you guys completely changed it. Yeah, I, like? I think that's so true, right? Coming in from the outside gave us a totally fresh perspective, right? And I think the the mindset at the time when we started the company was that, you know, the only way to make a thermostat better was to make it cheaper, right? And so it was a race to how do I get the cheapest thing into your how, home, not how can we make you more comfortable? You know, how can we help you save energy? How can we help you have a more positive impact? And I think, you know, thinking through what the customer value is, versus just a plain price equation is what created the opportunity and, and really created the market for us. And realizing that, you know, there are all kinds of people who, yes, they care about price, but they care about saving money more, right? They care about the environment more. And, um, you know, I know when we started, you know, when we were pitching VCs and, you know, I tell people I got turned down 174 times and, you know, they all thought I was crazy, right? They were like, no one's gonna spend more than $49 for a thermostat, right? And it was that shift in mindset that really, you know, created the opportunity. And I would say like, you know, that is where opportunity is. If you look at like the iPhone and the phone market before that, you know, the Razor, the Nokia candy bar phones, they were also all about how do we make this thing cheaper? Like it's already as good as it's gonna be, how do we make it cheaper? And Apple really went in the other direction and said like, how do we create more value for customers? And, and so I think, again, another way of thinking about how you solve um, you know, customer challenges and how you build your company. It's funny. You mentioned 174 rejections. My message to VCs is always the same. Entrepreneurs are never going to forget. Be gentle with your nose because they are <laughs> going to remember them forever. You know, you're not going to get every hit right, but you, you know, for God's sakes, uh, be gentle because some of these people you're going to be wrong about, they're going to build a giant company and they're not going to forget. I, I'm curious about you know, one of the things that's definitely changed from 2007 to 2022, I think, at least in my view, there's a lot more willingness on the part of the venture capital community, the private equity community to finance hardware startups. I think in 2007, that must have been brutally difficult. I think today under the right conditions. OK, as we sit here in 22, it's difficult for everybody, but we will return to normalcy. It seems like hardware is more financeable, but it comes with a condition. I believe this is my hypothesis. You have to have some kind of story around recurring revenue. Is this, I, I suspect you guys are maybe not as in tune with the, the financing world, maybe still raising a little bit, but is that broadly true from what you've observed? Is it different now in a major way from 2007? And is this recurring revenue thing something that you would advise uh, hardware entrepreneurs to be thinking about? So let, let me start with your first point. So one of my favorite quotes is a Scott Adams quote, uh, about venture capital, where he said, uh, you know, venture capital is the only profession where you get paid an outrageous amount of money to be wrong 90% of the time. <laughs> and so if you're sitting in a VC office and someone is telling you that, you know, you've got it all wrong, et cetera, et cetera, don't worry, they're wrong 90% of the time. And so, um, you know, 
again, keep the passion and, 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 and keep going would be my uh, advice. I think um, as it pertains to recurring revenue, I think VCs invest in companies that have good business models. And it doesn't necessarily need to be recurring revenue, but generally recurring revenue uh, models, if you can get traction, are good business models. Um, but there are plenty of, of, of businesses that have done you know, incredibly well uh, that don't. Uh, most hardware businesses are trying to attach recurring revenue. So whether you're GoPro, whether you're um, iRobot, for example, with the Roomba would be another, you know, very successful one. Fitbit's another one. Um, but a lot of those companies, Fitbit, you know, iRobot started off as, you know, GoPro, like pure hardware companies and, and you know, founders built great companies um, on a great hardware experience and really, you know, exploiting a uh, consumer insight and a niche in the market where other people weren't playing. If wrong side of impossible is my favorite question, my second favorite question is who out there in IoT land is doing great work that you think not enough people are talking about? You've got a very big voice in the space. You've been, you know, uh, in I in in uh, home automation for 15 years. Who who do you look at? Um, a lot of people look at Ecobee and their fans. Who is Ecobee fans of? Who is Stuart fans of? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, um, it's a bit anecdotal, right? So I'm, I'm really excited about the, the portable battery market right now, um, you know, because it gives you an opportunity to, you know, create resiliency in your home. You know, you can plug your fridge into it, the power goes out, you know, you don't have to worry about your, your food going bad, but you can, you know, unplug it, take it on the road, tailgate with it or go camping or, or you know, whatever those things are, you know, Generac has a great battery product, portable battery product that just come out. There are a few other ones. I'm really excited about that technology. I think it's pretty interesting. I also happen to like, you know, gardening. And so, um, you know, I don't know that, you know, that it's you know totally out there and different, but, uh, you know, Harvest 360 has a great, you know, indoor hydroponic garden and, you know, you can grow basil and stuff like that and indoor plants. And I just think it's really cool. So I've never been like a real green thumb and, that product makes you better. And so I'm excited about that one. You're, uh, I believe in, in Canada, Toronto, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's right. Yep. So when you're talking about hydroponic, I suspect this is born out of a pretty short, short growing season for you guys. <laughs> yes, it is. So I use a product, so I'll plug, I rarely plug on the air. I use a product called uh, Lettuce Grow. It's kind of a play on words, oh, cool. lettuce like the you know leafy green. Yep. Um, I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with this, but I looked really hard at the home hydroponic space, you know, and was impressed with what they came up with. Oh, I'm also a gardener. Maybe this is like a secret CEO thing. You know, we need something to, <laughs> that we actually can control, not just something we think we can control, which is our companies. <laughs> Cool. Well, so, you know, Ecobee, you, you mentioned a couple of names out there. I think you said Roomba, you said, um, you talked about Nest, uh, others. What these, a lot of them have in common, you mentioned GoPro. GoPro is, you know, 95% down in the market. The others have been acquired. Roomba, of course, recently acquired by Amazon. What's next for you guys? You know, talk to me about Ecobee and, and uh, as we roll into 23 and 24, what are you excited about? What's the future look like? I think we're really excited about, uh, you know, two things. One is going deep in energy. And I think if you look at what's happening with renewable power, um, it's the cheapest power on the grid. Um, it is variable. Um, and so the idea of having these intelligent appliances that understand what's happening on the grid, the carbon content and the pricing, and can use that to create arbitrage, right? California in 2020 curtailed enough clean power. In other words, they shut off enough clean power to power 130,000 homes for a year, right? And that's doubling every single year. And so there's this amazing amount of clean power that's available now. And if you're a smart appliance and you can tap into that, you know, you can essentially cool your home for free in the summertime, you know, if you get access to that. And that I think is a, you know, incredible opportunity driven by, you know, solar storage, renewable and the pricing curves on, on all of those. So that's the first thing we're doing. The second thing we're really focused on is, um, AI and machine learning and creating these intelligent agents or emergent experiences that understand the context of what's happening in your house. And that enables us to create great security solutions, for example, and you know, let you know if someone's breaking into your house or something happens when you're not there. But it also really helps us manage your energy because you really manage your energy in one of three ways. You're either home and awake, you're home and asleep, or you're away. Right. And if we can understand the context of what's happening in your home, we can automatically manage your energy for you and create significantly better outcomes. And so, you know, 
I'm super excited about that. And, and when we talk about, you know, what happens in 2030 and beyond, I think, you know, we see a world where, you know, there's an abundance of clean, cheap energy and how much you use is as important as when you use it and creating these intelligent devices that can figure that out for you and lower your energy bills, uh, we think is a great opportunity. I love it. Stuart, I have a question for you next time. We'll get into this when I meet you in person at a conference or uh, next awesome. time we have you on the show. But hydro I might come power. out skiing or something like that. Yeah, How far we'd love away to have you. <laughs> we are, you know, is, we're recording this episode in November 2022, and it has been snowing every day since mid-October. So we are going to have, wow. I think, a gigantic ski season this year, which brings <laughs> me to my next question, hydro-related. So here in, the, uh, in our neck of the woods, you know, so we're – Rocky Mountains. Hydropower is a big source of where we get our electricity from. And I still, all these years later, don't know exactly how to feel about hydro because the destruction to the the natural fisheries in this part of the world. I mean, you could just use talk to these old time fishermen and they're like, look, I mean, we used to have salmon in these waters. And so it's very clean energy. It's powering a lot of homes. Uh, I, I still, all these years later, don't know exactly how to feel about hydro. So let's pick it up there next time. I'd love to hear your take on hydropower. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll leave it there for today. Stuart Lombard, thank you so much for coming on Over the Air. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening. Join me next time as we talk with another founder to discuss what went wrong on a journey that went right.